Okay, good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many of you joining us yet again for the third session of the technical officiating. Um, really pleased you could all make it this evening. Um, so tonight's topic, this module, is, as we said before, was mainly aimed at those who have had little competition sheet and event management experience or may not may not have done it for a long time and i guess we could probably all fit ourselves into that bracket because uh, it's been 11 months since lockdown so i guess the lucky ones amongst you may have done the british schools last year and then that was it so the first thing we're going to uh, deal with is the introductions and agenda then we're going to move into competition methods and athlete management. We'll look at some aspects around the weighing. So uh, what types of weighing and what considerations, what concessions that can be. We'll then look at some ad hoc specific scenarios. Um, and we'll just take them one at a time and just look at them just to try and give you some guidance um, on what would be the ideal solution. As always, the summary clarifications um, is a list of questions. I hope you've all bought your pen and paper. Those who haven't joined us before, don't worry about questions. No one is gonna be specifically asked a question that they've got to answer in public. This is all for your own learning and development and you will choose who, if indeed you do want to share with anybody or not. So the way it will happen, is the questions will be asked one at a time, going up to 10, you write your own answers down, then we give you the answers. And after that, you can ask for any clarifications that you may want. The module is scheduled to take about 60 to 70 minutes tonight, I would have thought, uh, but we have allowed the normal 60 to 90. The important thing is that you ensure your audio is off throughout the presentation. Um, the reason we ask this is that if your audio is on, it disturbs the presentation. Um, so it's all questions. Please use the chat room. Okay. So people on the, on this particular presentation this evening is myself, British Judo staff member, and I will do the presentation. And then in support. We have uh, Andrew Afner as a competition controller. He'll be one of the people providing technical support. Uh, Andrew, as most of you will probably know, is a board director, so it's great uh, to have a board director involved. We've got Denise Oates, uh, another competition controller and technical support, and he's chair of the Eastern Area and also of Kumo. Uh, we've got Lamp Malcolm Limerick, another competition controller providing technical support. He's the president of Samurai Judo Club. So we've got a real, real st strength and depth uh, to answer your, your questions. So this module, it's all these modules are designed to, to help you refresh all aspects of that particular discipline. This one just happens to be how competitions are managed in line with uh, BJA guidelines. Again, I'll reiterate, feel free to ask any questions, but please type them into the chat room uh, and then the technical support personnel will uh, sort those out for you. Don't be worried about the volume of, of stuff we're doing. You'll be mentored at events um, by the more experienced uh, technical officials. Pretty much as we've always done in the past, we'll work as a team um, and make sure we help each other to get the right solution for the athlete. So don't worry too much that you've got to remember every single item um, because it's always a team effort on the day. And very much the situations and the processes and the procedures, they're not purposefully made any with any particular difficulty or unrealistic. They are what really happens in competition today. Um, so it, it is uh, a, real, a real type situation. So we'll start off um, with the methods of competition. And what, what I really want to start with 
is the IJF ranking placings. So what we've got here, as probably most of you will recognize, is a simple knockout. And it's all about the placings of the athletes into the eight positions. Let's assume for the purpose of this that we do actually have exactly eight athletes. And of course, we've got exactly eight places. So ranking, and the ranking, we'll talk a little bit about ranking later, but the ranking is absolutely critical to the placing of the athletes and ensuring as far as you possibly can that the right athletes um, are matched um, with also the, their right opponents. We do not want, for the sake of a competition, for example, the very best athlete matched with the second best athlete in any match apart from the final. Of course, competitions don't go exactly to ranking. It's very, very rare that every match would go exactly to, uh, to the ranking system. But on a law of averages, the system is such that it's designed to ensure that the best athlete gets the best opportunity to get to the final. So if we look on this left-hand side, and I've highlighted four positions in green. So the number one ranked athlete goes in the first position. And as the number one ranked athlete in the system, they have earned the right to fight in the first match, the eighth ranked person. So the top rank versus the bottom rank. Also, the number one has earned the right not to be on the same side of the draw as two and three. So therefore, four is on the same side as one. Two, who is the second best athlete, is on the opposite side, and so is three. And as you can see, so the first best athlete fights the lowest. The second highest athlete fights the second lowest. The third highest athlete fights the third lowest, and the fourth the fourth lowest. And this can, this system, it's an IJF designed system uh, for the ranking, and it can be extrapolated into any multiple uh, that we wish it to. And we'll, we'll have a look at that now. So if we look at what we could have, so this is the situation that we've just looked at where we've got one and four on the same side and two and three on the opposite side uh, of the knockout competition. This uh, particular format would be used for any number from five to eight competitors inclusive. Okay, so if we get more than eight competitors, we have the next one, which is nine to 16. So any athletes from nine to 16. But the important thing to notice here, we've got the one, four, two and three outlined again. So one and four are on the same side and two and three are on the opposite side. And very importantly, the basic principles, the highest ranked athlete fights in the first match the lowest ranked athlete the second highest fights the second lowest and so on for three and four so this method of competition is uh it, it really helps the athletes who've earned the ranking to get as far as they possibly can before they have to fight uh, the next best athlete and I've put the, the 32 situation into it as well. It'd be very rare that we use 32 uh, in the British systems now because what we generally do in uh, development events is have pools first and then move into a knockout. And you'd have to have a hell of a lot of people. You'd have to have probably approaching well, 60 people in, any, in a particular category before you'd have pools. To 32 so it's not something that you see now but it's up there for the basic principle again so the one 
four are in the top half, two and three are in the bottom half. Number one fights number 32, number two fights 31 and so on. So you can see that basic principle just carries on right throughout the system. So we move on to pools. So the usual system for a level one event is to have a single pool and for level two events is to have two pools with the winner and runner up of each pool proceeding to a semi-final. Very basic stuff, but in a single pool, of course, when all the matches have been fought, um, the medal positions should be clear because uh, the person who's finished top of the pool will get gold, se uh, second will get silver, and third and fourth will be bronze. So that will be just in a single pool. If it's a level one event, um, if you add a pool of five, maybe uh, you would consider giving a third bronze medal as well, um, because this really is their introduction to tournaments and uh, we're trying to encourage people. So they've presented themselves and fought four matches if it's a pool of five. So yeah, a third bronze medal would not be out of order. If we're going to two pools, the winner of pool one fights the runner up of pool two and vice versa. So as the winner, you earn the right not to fight the winner of the other pool, but the winners of the two semi-finals will compete in the final for the gold medal. Of course, the loser gets a silver. The loser in this particular case, where it's just two pools with crossover, the losers of the semi-finals, that is also their final match. So they automatically become the bronze medalists because they're the only two left. Okay. We rarely use uh, pools in international competition. The reason is um, in international competition, it's a bit more to the point of uh, who is the best athlete and the fact that someone may have spent a thousand euros getting to an event and has 10 seconds in the first match because they were thrown for rip on. Um, that's just a little bit unfortunate in an international competition, but it's not really what we want to be doing in British tournaments. Uh, in a British tournament, we use the pool system before the knockout, so as to give players the opportunity to have the experience of more than one contest, even if they lose that first one. You just imagine uh, if in your, if in the first match you uh, you're fairly new to the situation and you happen to draw one of the high seeds and you're out very quickly. You know your mom, your dad, you you've all invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and you've come to a competition maybe for less than one minute. It's not really a good situation. So British Judo would like, um, well, do put forward that we use the, the pool systems before the knockout. So as everybody hopefully gets three matches, it may be two in some cases, but we try to make it three matches uh, to make it worthwhile experience. <clears throat> There's a, a typical pool sheet for four. This is the sort of thing you'll see. So you'll see the table officials and referee lists on there. So you've got the names and uh, so you can see who is in charge. So if there is any discrepancy, um, it can be sorted out with the officials at, at that particular match. We've got the event name and date. And over here, there should be some basic information for you as, as a, a CR to tell you what is going to happen or what could happen uh, in the event. So are strangles and arm locks allowed in this particular event or are technical restrictions enforced? The category will tell you a lot about these things, but it's, it's also good to have this marked on there as well. And of course, the duration. Generally speaking, in mainstream judo, it will be three or four minutes. Um, in uh, adaptive judo or very senior masters that could be uh, less time. But this is a single pool. And of course, the after all the matches, the order that they finish will actually be the final result. 
In terms of the uh, two pools to crossover, which we spoke about earlier, the format of the sheet is the same. So the, all the new sheets um, are actually on the website now. And we, we thank another Samurai member for that, which is Stefan Newbury, who prepared those for us. Uh, He's not on here, so I can't thank him publicly, but it was Stephanie who prepared them. Um, so we got the event and the date, this basic detail again. So it's all really clear for you what could possibly happen in that event. Um, so two pools of four, what you'd expect is one and two, not what you would expect, what must happen. Uh, one and two go through into the knockout. So if we consider the left hand one, to be pool one, the winner will go into the first white slot and the second one will go into the last blue slot. And of course, vice versa for pool two. So the winner of pool two will go into the second white slot and the second in pool two will go into the first blue slot. And we just run it out through that method. So how do we actually get this interface working between uh, pools and knockout? It's sometimes not quite as straightforward as you might think. And for those sort of dusting away the cobwebs, let's have a little look at what we're talking about. So if, for example, in your particular event, uh, you've got an odd number of pools, which is going to progress on to a knockout, and we're using the IGF ranking system, although uh, that isn't going to make much difference to the way we put them into the system. It's necessary to rank the athletes to avoid a rematch of a previous fight before the final. The last thing we want um, is a match that's happened in a pool to reoccur in the knockout before the final. That's not really fair to the two athletes uh, to fight twice before the final. Of course, it can happen in the final because for whatever reason on the day, uh, an anomaly with the ranking, the first and best athlete are in the same pool. So it's possible they could fight earlier, but we don't certainly don't want the second match before the final. The qualifying players from the pools our number as such. So the winner of pool one will be the number one athlete, the winner of pool two, number two athlete, and so on through all your pools. Then we will number the runners up in the opposite way through the pools. So for example, this is the pool number. And in this particular example, we have five pools. So pool one to five going down, nice and simple. The winner is the same as the pool number, one, two, three, four, five. Then to get the uh, runners up into an order where they don't fight um, the people they've already fought in their pool before the final, we number in the reverse order. So we go one, two, three, four, five going down, for the winners and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten going up for the runners up. Then when you put these numbers into the IJF ranking system, it will put the people who fought in the same pool on opposite sides of the draw. It's slightly different if you've got an even number of pools. So when you've got an even number of pools, it's Again, it's necessary to take action to make sure they don't fight again before the final. So what we do is we do exactly what we did before, but with the even pools, you swap over the runner up number. So that say, for example, you had six pools, you'd swap over uh, seven and eight and nine and 10 and so on. It's better to talk about it when I got the sheet up. So the pool, one to six, the winner, one to six, exactly the same as with the odd number of pools. But 
when we go numbering up with the runner up, you can see there's a change. So instead of having seven at the bottom and eight here, those two are swapped over. Nine and 10, those two are swapped over. And 11 and 12, those two are swapped over. So the runner up swapped between pools one and two, three and four, five and six. And this just makes sure that they can't be matched again until the final when using the IGF placing system. So I look at simple repper charge after knockout. So in the simple knockout system, everyone who lost to the eventual finalists go into the repper charge. So it did, <sighs> there are some exceptions to that, but in general, in general terms, if they lost through a normal fashion, they will be going into the repper charge. The player who lost the finalist in round one of the knockout bites the player who lost in round two. So if we've got a player who's gone all the way to the final, the first two players that that athlete beat will fight in the first round of the repper charge. And the winner of that match will fight the third person that the finalist beat on the way to the final and so on until all the people um, have had an opportunity right up to and including the semi-final. One of the easiest ways to do this is to circle the players who lost to each finalist and then place them in. So <clears throat> on the day, under pressure, it could be that it's a little bit difficult to keep concentration with people asking you questions and, and you're trying to guide other people. So it's, it's much better just to get to the look at the finalist and work backwards and circle each person that they beat. However, this is the exception I spoke about on the, on the last slide, a player who lost by Fusengachi. So Fusengachi means that they didn't turn up for their match on time. So that they, the opponent won by default or against or Ansukamaki against the spirit of judo does not go into the repper charge and the position is left blank. So if it's a Fusengachi or an Ansukamaki against the spirit of judo, this means the athlete is out of the tournament. The Fusengachi is because they didn't turn up. So, and the Ansukamaki against the spirit of judo, against the spirit of judo in general terms, um, will be something either very dangerous to the opponent or derogatory to someone. So if they commit those type of offences, um, the lesson they have to learn is that they're actually out of the tournament for not showing the right level uh, of respect for the other person's health or indeed uh, not treating them in a proper manner. So let's have a look um, at what we mean by a simple repertoire charge after knockout. And what we've got here is, is the two finalists, Leah and Sarah. So what we said was look at the finalist and then go backwards to decide uh, who are the people that go into the repper charge. So Leah in the semi-final beat Alison. So Alison's in there. In the quarter-final, she beat Laura. And in the round before, she actually had a bye. But very importantly, um, you still need to circle the boy because the boy is a factor to go into the repper charge. It just means that the athlete they're supposedly fighting in the first round, they also get a boy in the repper charge. And of course, the other side is exactly the same. So be careful with names as well. So we've got a Sarah and a Sarah Jane here. And these people do actually exist in real life. Uh, there is a Sarah and there is a Sarah Jane. So Sarah beats Sarah Jane. So Sarah Jane uh, is the final one in the repper charge. Sarah beat Nicole in the quarter final. So she's in the repper charge. And Sarah beat Pat in uh, the first round match. So um, would anybody like to, as a a calculation of 
who should be in round one, position one? Who should be in that box? There you go. Oh. So, bye. Yes. So, Leah had a bye in the first round. So, we get to this. In the second round, Leah beat Laura. So, bye and Laura. Laura is automatically uh, propelled into the next round where she will fight Alison. And on the other side, so they maintain the side of the draw. So the first one is Pat, who lost to Sarah. Nicole then lost to Sarah. So the winners of these two then fight Sarah Jane. Hopefully you can figure that through. Okay. Uh, are we doing okay with the questions, people? Right, let's have a little look at the, at the weigh-in then, some of the challenges we can get in the weigh-in. So, basically there are two types of weigh-in, a defined weight categories. Um, so basically IJF standard for the categories where IJF exists um, and group separation by actual weight, so index system. So the actual weight system is normally used with beginners, low grades and adaptive events. And it's sometimes even when it's not planned to use that particular category, it's useful to record the exact weight. Because if you've got an event where there's not many entries, um, you may decide to amalgamate certain categories or even have a category when it's over a certain amount of kilograms. But the last thing you want to be doing is having, you know, when we're talking about children of 30 or 40 something kilos, you don't want to be going into the realms of five to 10 kilo differences um, because, you know, that, that's a quarter of a body weight. You have 40 kilo fighting 50 kilo, and there's probably going to, you know, Law of averages there'll probably be an age difference as well. So uh, it's it's not a good situation. So it's good to have the exact weight and it enables the tournament director to decide how they're going to split um, the athletes into various pools and categories to make sure that we get a meaningful event and that it's not overly biased or indeed possibly dangerous uh, to someone uh, who's not really prepared to fight somebody significantly ever than themselves. Um, in the way in, allow parents or coaches to be present with under 18 players. Um, and in brackets, it generally speeds up the process. You know, probably the last thing that some very young children are thinking about is the process they're doing at that moment in time. So uh, with a bit of direction from mom and dad or the coach, um, it generally gets them through that weighing process. But the things to make sure of is don't allow any adult to be compromised by being alone with an under 18 age player. And of course, there's no, there's no photographs in the weighing area. But you know, the really big, big important point is uh, it's better to man uh, a weigh-in uh, with two people above 18 years of age doing, doing the process um, and then everyone is protected really. Allowances, of course there's some allowances because we don't have a perfect situation or indeed we wouldn't want um, to have IJF standard on all tournaments. So we'll have what's called an open weigh-in and in the open weigh-in, we'll have a 0.6 kilogram allowance for boys and girls wearing trousers and t-shirt. Um, these days, minors, uh, boys are, are allowed to wear a t-shirt as well as the girls, if they so wish. In cadet, 
and below events, players must always weigh in wearing trousers. The, they cannot opt to say, I, I want to take my trousers off. That that is not that's not in the script because they're getting the allowance for it. And uh, the point five for trousers at the young age it, it is, is good. It, it's about right. So the point one for a T-shirt is if the boys decide they don't want a T-shirt, it is their option, but um, they are entitled to have the T-shirt and receive the point one. They may as well have the T-shirt because the T-shirt is about point one, so it doesn't really matter. For level four junior events, and I will emphasize that star, level four and junior. So this is not cadet or pre-cadet. It's acceptable to have players wearing underwear only and receive just a 0.1 kilogram allowance for their underwear. Of course, this sort of weigh-in should be in a closed environment. Um, and it should be stuffed with a couple of people of the same gender, of course. Um, and alternatively, the trousers and T-shirt, you could choose that uh, that way forward. But whatever you do in this environment, either the point 0.1 with underwear or 0.6 with trousers and T-shirt, British Judo will be happy with either one, but it's very, very important to state on the entry form which method you're going to be using. Um, so there's no argument on the day and, and coaches getting a, a little bit upset or, or the player themselves getting a little bit upset. So it, it's all about clarity and openness. What's going to happen on the day? What are the options? And everybody can take the option that they want to take. Low level senior events. You could, if seniors can have a strip weigh-in if they want. Closed environment, same gender doing the weigh-in, uh, they can strip. But quite often, level one, level two events won't have the facility to, uh, to maintain the modesty of, of, of people. So for seniors, we up the allowance a little bit because the trousers are a little bit heavier because they're a bit bigger. So it's 0.8 kilogram. And it's the same for men and women because um, in general, the women are a little bit smaller than the men. That's just a, a scientific fact. Um, so it, may, it makes up for the T-shirt uh, that the ladies would, uh, would need to be wearing in this case. So it's 0.8 for seniors, uh, again, very important on your um, entry form that it's stated what you can do. So is the event going to be a strip weighing or is it going to be a 0.8 kilo? Very important that people know what, what's possible. Strip or underwear only weighing must be staffed by same gender. All really should be staffed by same gender officials. If people are dressed in trousers and t-shirt, it's possible um, that, that could be a little bit of movement there. But generally, anything less than that, well, not generally, always less than that, you must have same gender. Minimum two, closed environment, only members of the same gender. Really, really important. Um, other variances for juniors and seniors. So the BJA ranking events, the procedures for players, to weigh in wearing underwear and receive a 0.1 allowance. The reason for this, you know, it, it speeds things up. And also it protects the people who are below 18 years of age. You know, there is an argument to say the ones that are, that are actually 18 are in top, but not, it's to treat everybody the same. So we'll have everybody with that 0.1 kilogram allowance. Um, wearing underwear. The weighing should therefore be closed to persons on So we, we don't want any helpers or if, if it's the girls weighing, we don't want the, the dad going in or if it's the boys weighing, we don't want mom going in. It's, um, it's important 
that we stick to that and, and protect everybody and, and don't embarrass anybody. Players over 18 should be able to strip complain, uh, completely with no one else. And players under 18 should retain underwear. This is just a, an ad hoc statement that just to reinforce what we've said already. And we says should be able to strip completely. They should be able to, but the constraints of the venue could quite easily prevent us from doing that. So again, we have to be a little bit flexible, but remember, must be on the entry form. And again, we'll mention again, 0.8 kilogram for male senior players wearing trousers and female with trousers and t-shirt. And you can use it for the, for the small events. So that's all we have to say really on uh, the weighing. And now we have some uh, specific scenarios, ad hoc scenarios uh, that happen. So, or, or some advice such as we have here. So running the table, for example, some basics that we need to do. And it, it seems really, really elementary and obvious, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Um, and then we find ourselves a little bit embarrassed uh, on the first match. So the best thing to do is to get to the table and make sure the equipment works before the competition starts. When the first match is about to start, that's not the time to check it. Secondly, familiarise yourself with the scoreboards at the start of the day. It may be a system that you're very, very familiar with, and that's great. Um, if it is, happy days. But if it's slightly different, there's no problem with getting there 20, 30 minutes earlier and having a little play around with the scoreboard, making sure you know exactly what you're doing in terms of getting the right scores, the right hold downs on the right side at the right time. Um, just that bit of familiarity without any pressure can quite often be a, a real help. Have a manual backup if needed. Um, yeah, it's, I know that it's rare that we do actually have the manual buckle freely available uh, under the table or ready to go, but there really should be a manual buckle ready to go somewhere in the easy to access in the venue so as we don't halt the tournament if the electronic equipment fails. So just make yourself aware before you sit down where the manual backup is. If it's in the cupboard that you know and it's open and you can get it, fine. Just make sure you know so as you don't hold up the tournament too much. Microphone, public address, any sort of public address. Um, please make sure that you extend your courtesy to the other mats that are operating if it's a multi mat environment. Um, and because Two people speaking at the time is not really going to work too well. So let's make sure that the other people have finished uh, before you take over. But make sure your microphone's off in case you're having a chat that, about stuff that really shouldn't be going public. For example, eating your noisy sandwich at the table. It may be that you're not working at that point in time. So you're eating your sandwich. Don't really want that going up over the microphone. So the microphone, as soon as you've stopped speaking, switch it off, and it gives usually gives for a, a better quality for the next person as well. When you're calling the players, it's nice to be friendly with the players and form a relationship, and you can do that by using first names if you want but just be really, really careful if you're using a first name um, that if there's more than one person with that or very, very similar, um, you could get the wrong athlete and get the wrong athlete into the match uh, provides us with all sorts of difficulties. So it's good practice to use both names, um, but I can understand if you've got a set of players and you know them um, and it's a clear differential first names would be fine. And part of our role, and I would include the referees in this as well as the technical officials, is to politely remind 
Uh, we've got young players, if any players really, um, but when they're off the mat, um, they really need to have the footwear on, uh, and especially in the breaks. You know, if someone comes off the mat, they've, they're a bit excited, they've just won their first match uh, in a tournament. Uh, it's quite easy in the excitement just to come off the mat and run off to go and see mum or dad, and they've took 30 or 40 paces on a dirty floor. So just remind them in a nice way just to um, get the footwear on. When players going onto the mat, um, the standard is the first named player wears white in all systems. So whoever you call first should be the white. Um, and if it is white and blue kits, so if it's a tournament where the event requires them to wear a white judogi or a blue judogi, they can wear their grey belt. If it's white kits only, so white and blue belts. Um, as a referee and a technical official, I really prefer the white and blue kits because it makes things so much easier to see what, what arms and legs are going where in, 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 the, in the groundwork. But if it's not, it's not. But the important thing for us to remember when we're running the table is the first player wears white and the second player wears blue. Even though you may have planned, you know, those experienced ones amongst you may have planned many events, uh, many matches, sorry, ahead. Um, it's always good practice not to call the next set of players until the ones that are waiting have moved onto the mat. So normally we'll have two athletes on the mat competing and as soon as they've gone onto the mat to start the match, we should call the, set, the next set so as they can get ready, just in case there's any difficulty with belts or judogi or anything like that. Call them straight away as soon as the first ones are on and they're ready. But it becomes uh confusing if you then call a second set to wait behind people get mixed up it, so it's best not to do that wait until the pair that are at the edge go onto the mat and then call the next set and they'll know to wait until the previous match is finished of course calling on a microphone with a very, very loud public address doesn't guarantee that everybody was listening and have heard. It's, it's good practice for us uh, to make sure that we have actually got two players that are ready or getting ready. Um, we don't like to uh, put people out of the tournament with Fusen Gachi because they didn't turn up. So it's best to put a bit of effort in at the beginning and we try and get the right two players waiting. We don't want to put, stop putting uh, the one minute call out. It's going to delay the tournament as well as being in, um, not a nice finish for someone. Result of the contest is obviously paramount um, to conclude the match. In many events at development level, we can encourage the winners to report to the table to make sure you have the correct player as the winner. But if there's any doubt whatsoever, ask the referee who won. If you're not really sure, you know, someone may have been distracting you just as the referee gave the signal. So you didn't actually see the signal because someone distracted you. You've then got to be very, very sure who actually won that match. You can probably tell by the look on the face most of the time, but that's that's not enough, really. So you need to be very, very sure who won that match. And the referee should be able to, well, will be able to tell you um, if there's any doubt. A lot of mistakes, um, you know, admin mistakes can be rectified, you know, little bits and pieces here and there. It's not quite right the way things are recorded. Um, can be changed later on. But if the wrong winner is recorded, 
and it's unnoticed before the that person is due in the next match. So that player does actually go, the wrong player goes into the next round and he's then called for another match. Then it becomes a very, very difficult and sticky situation uh, to overcome. So it's really, really important that we be as sure as we possibly can that the right winner is recorded. And if, and if you're really in trouble, um, ask for assistance and you may even have to stop play if it's a serious matter. For competitions that count for downgrading points, they are recorded on the, on the person's downgrade card by senior staff in control. But no matter how senior or how experienced the people are on the control table, they can only act on the information that you've put on the sheet. So it's really, really important in a point scoring competition that um, everything is legible and the right players, another reason, not just for the competition, this is for the grand grading as well, that the right players, players have got the right amount of points. You know, even as something as simple as uh, maybe blue wins by a, a throw and you put T, and don't circle it. People at control are going to think that's a Wazari win. Um, and therefore, the person is not going to get their 10 points for the, towards the downgrading. So it's really important we, we have it correct. And I see very, very, very few errors in this area. But, you know, we're all in the same boat here. We've all had a, at least 11 months out it's going to be easy to make uh, one or two little errors. So we just need to concentrate just that little bit more. If a player fails to appear, we must give them in the British system three minutes. And that doesn't matter how long the contest time is. They have three minutes with calls at one minute intervals. And only after the third minute has expired uh, would a fuse and gachi uh, be applied. And then that fuse and gachi is applied, they are out of the, this is a really serious um, decision to take. So, because they're actually out of the competition. Um, it says here that the tournament director must be consulted. It's always good to get the, the tournament director involved in this sort of situation, because there may have been some extenuating circumstances um, that they're aware of, and, and just keep everybody involved so we're on top of this. You know, if it's Fuse and Gatti, it's Fuse and Gatti, but uh, we would like to try to avoid that uh, in all possibilities. And that's why Great Britain stays with the three minutes in international competitions, it's 30 seconds. It's much easier for an international athlete because they've got so many helpers. If this happens in the knockout stage, they cannot compete in the repertoire. charge. So, it, 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 well, if it happens at any stage of the uh, event, they cannot continue. But the reason we've identified this is that some people may say, oh, well, I lost in the knockout, but I want to take my place in the repertoire, so I want to try for bronze. Unfortunately, that's not possible. If you have a Fusen Gachi, or indeed Ansukamaki against the Spirit of Judo, um, you are out of the event completely, no matter what stage you're at, it's, it's a complete finish. We've talked a little bit about direct hand sukumaki already, um, but with a direct hand sukumaki, the important thing for you to know and the referee, uh, it's their responsibility to tell you um, is whether it was direct and against the spirit of judo. Um, it, this is the sole decision of the refereeing team to decide whether it's against the spirit of judo or not. Um, uh, but it's the sole decision of the tournament director to decide what they do with that information. 
in general, if there's no anomalies, a direct against the spirit of judo means the competition is finished um, for that particular person. In a pool, in a pool match, and this can be a little bit irritating for the other players in a pool because uh, let's say in a pool of four, um, a player has appeared and someone has fought them for however long it is, maybe the whole three minutes and beaten them on a wasari. And the next match, they get direct hand sukumaki against the spirit of judo or fusengachi. The first match doesn't count either. Or in a pool, fusengachi or direct hand sukumaki against the spirit of judo makes all the matches in that particular pool void for the purpose of the pool calculation. What I mean by the pool calculation is deciding which positions they're in. So if you score 10 points against the person who gave Fuse and Gachi in the next match, that 10 points is gone. So it's a, it's a little bit hard on some of the other athletes if indeed they beat that person earlier. Uh, but no matter what, any contests that were completed, they still count for downgrade points. So again, still really important that if even if an athlete, say in the second match, got Fuse and Gachi, but in the first match, maybe have won by uh, a hold down for Ipom, that is clear on, on the pool sheet um, or knockout sheet, whatever it is, and the points can be attributed because they were valid at that particular time. We've already said it, but it was just a reiteration that if it happens in the knockout or repertoire, charge, their planned opponent in the next round gets a boy. No, no, the point of saying it here is that is there's no replacements. We don't go backwards and fetch someone else forward to put them in. Uh, the person who gets uh, Fusing Gachi or direct and Sukumaki against the Spirit of Judo is out of the tournament. Players sometimes go out, out of the tournament because of their own decision. Um, and their own decision, I would say, is high 90% because of an injury. Um, but if, if that player announces their decision to withdraw, the next place player in the pool should be moved up and placed in the knockout. So if at the end of the pool, let's say there's a pool of four and one, two, three, and one or two decide that they cannot continue and they inform, inform you of that case, you can move number three up into the appropriate position. If the important bit though, is to make sure we get this right and we attribute the positions uh, and give credit to the result, the other results in that particular pool. So if it's the player who finished top of the pool that pulls out, Number two moves to number one, and number three moves to number two. Of course, if it's the second place player who pulled out, it's just number three to number two. It's all about giving people opportunity and facilitating a, a good tournament in reality. If there are only two pools in the category, so you got, you know, you what we spoke about earlier, so with the crossover, it would be quite reasonable if the pool had been completed on both pools completed and then one of them decides to pull out for whatever reason it is, it would be reasonable to consider that person to be the loser in the semi-final and therefore uh, get the bronze medal. That would be that would be an acceptable thing to do because they have actually earned the right to be in the semi-final. And if they really wanted to, they could just walk on the mat and then immediately retire. So um, it, it's reasonable to give them the bronze medal. Use of competition, uh, computers in competition. So, you know, computers uh, taking over the world, but increasingly both recording and timekeeping are done on computer technology. Um, 
I've been through this myself from the beginning. Uh, when I was a, a competitor, it was uh, a manual timing clock with some buttons on the top and a manual scoreboard. I have to say the movement to electronic devices is wonderful. It makes it easier uh, for, the, uh, for the recorder and it's much more informative um, for the spectators and indeed the athlete who's in the match. So it's really, really important um, that we understand this technology because it is improving the quality of the events. But don't worry. If you don't, if you don't normally play around with con uh, computers or game machines, so, you, so you're a little bit concerned, the systems are designed to be easy to use. And with an experienced colleague, it's quite simple to understand what you press and when you press it. And quite often the buttons are colored, so you know which is blue and white. So it's made, it's made as friendly as, as it can possibly be, I think. Um, if you're recording the results directly to a computer though, it's very important that if the particular system that you're using doesn't save the result automatically, that you do actually manually save that result after every match. It can become, you know, if you were two or three matches down the line and the computer crashes, um, it could be a bit difficult to recall the matches uh, that haven't been saved. So, and it, it could put some stress in the system. Pen and paper is always useful by the side as backup. Um, pretty much like tonight on this module, pen and paper will be useful to you at the end. It's always good to have uh, a, a back out method. So that's that concludes the information um, that we want uh, to present this evening. Um, I'm just wondering how we're getting on uh, with the chat room. Is everybody satisfied? Looks like there's a fair bit of activity. Yeah, some good questions in there. Okay. So we now come to uh, the questions. And as I said right at the beginning, and I'll just reiterate, no one's going to be asked a direct question to themselves. And nobody is going to be expected to disclose their answers. This is purely um, for your own learning and it's, it's a private matter. So the first question, when using an odd number of pools to knock out formula, why do we number the pools runners up for the knockout in the opposite order. So why do we go down the sheet for the for the for the winners and up the sheet um, for the runners up when we have an odd number of pools? Why do we do that? Give you a few seconds just to write that down. The second one, when so it, it's obviously the same with an uh, even number of pools. So when using even number, why do we swap each pair of runners up numbers? So for if there's six pools, we go one to six going down. We'd normally go seven, eight, and we'll just move it so it's eight, seven. Why do we actually do that? I'm sure it's not for fun, and I'm sure it's got some purpose. So why do we actually do that? Number three, in a knockout competition, which athlete will the highest ranking athlete fight in the first match? Doesn't matter how many athletes there are um, in the knockout, which athlete will the highest ranking athlete fight in the first match? Well, we've done this one to death, but just to confirm, if a player loses a fight by Fuse and Gachi, where should they be placed in the repertoire? 
lost by Fusengachi. So the Fusengachis, they didn't actually turn up for the fight, having had three calls at one minute intervals. Where should they be placed in the ref charge? Number five, in a simple knockout, which athletes go into the ref charge? So how would you describe which athletes will go into the ref charge in a simple knockout? We had a look at this quite early on. I think it's probably the first sheet of uh, technical detail. So which athletes will go into the ref charge? If you know the order as well, that's fantastic, but you don't need it for this question. Where would you normally use single pool competition categories? So where in an event with a particular category just have a single pool? In the case of using two pools to knock out, what happens if the final is a match that has already taken place in one of the pools earlier? So the final match, the gold medal match, is the same match as the first match of the day, for example. What happens in the final? Number eight, why may it be useful to record the exact weight of players at the weigh-in? rather than just saying they were within their specific band. So um, they you know, maybe a three or four kilo band. What is their exact weight? Why would it be useful to record that exact weight? Number nine, if a player fails to appear for the contest, what must the officials do before eliminating that player from the competition. So the player doesn't actually appear for the contest. What must you do before putting the player out of the competition? And the final uh, question, if a player who finished top of the pool then decides to withdraw for any reason, what should happen? So this is the pool is completely finished. The number one player decides they cannot continue for whatever reason it is, usually injury, but it could be a, a, another reason. Decides to withdraw. What should you do in terms of selecting the athletes for the next round? It's pools to knock out. Which athletes are you going to put forward into the next round? Okay, so now you can check yourself. Um, you got the answers to the questions. And, and don't worry if, about any of this presentation or the questions or the answers if you haven't got them now. It's the whole presentation will be made available electronically. Um, I will gain a link for it. Um, and we'll distribute it. Okay, so we've now reached the point where you can ask uh, any questions that you want. Um, so if there's any questions, about any of the material that we've done this evening, please feel free uh, to post your questions in the chat function, or as we've actually completed the presentation, um, it would be okay to put your audio on as well if you want to.